today, which is our programming uh, that we've planned in response to the recent events. I also want to give a shout out to the staff of the South Asia program, Daniel Bass and Gloria Lima Chavez, Scott Beamer of the Anadi Center, as well as the director of the Cardati for their support in making this event happen. I'm very pleased to announce that our event today will be moderated by my colleague, Professor Mustafa Manawi, who is faculty in the history department and also the director of the critical Ottoman and post-Ottoman studies at Cornell. He's the initiator of this event, and I'm so grateful he's agreed to moderate the question and answers from the audience. He'll be gathering the questions from the audience and posing them to our speakers after the speakers have spoken. Our guest speakers today are Professor Muska Dastagir. She is a faculty member of the American University of Afghanistan, which is based in Kabul. She's an expert and a lecturer in peace and conflict resolution, political theory, and gender studies. She has degrees from Oxford, Sciences Po, and the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. Our second guest, Professor Harun Rahimi, is assistant professor in the law faculty at the American University of Afghanistan. He has a doctor in a law degree from the University of Washington in Seattle, and was a visiting fellow at the Oxford Center for Islamic Studies. With that introduction, I'll turn this event over to our moderator, Professor Mustafa Manawi. Thank you very much, Professor Ghosh. Of course, I did this the, the, the sin of not turning on my microphone on Zoom, which we've been using for two years, and I still do the same thing. Anyway, welcome everybody. We have about 280 people that have already logged on. We have about 800 registered people. So it's a big event with a lot of people watching and we're really excited to be hosting it. It's a very, very important topic and we wanted to hear from uh, our colleagues uh, who, are, who live in Afghanistan, who work in Afghanistan about what's happening in Afghanistan. Um, uh, I'm going to be talking very little. Uh, I will just be uh, directing traffic, essentially, because I want to leave as much time as possible to our guests, Professor Dastagir and Professor Rahimi, uh, to tell us about what's going on there. They are the experts. Um, before I start, I also want to uh, uh, send a big thank you to Professor Durbagosh, uh, my colleague in the history department to Professor Iftihar Dadi, the director of the um, South Asia program, to Dr. Daniel Bast, the manager of the South Asia program, for making this happen. The way this is going to work is that uh, both Professor Dastair and uh, Professor Rahimi uh, will talk about specific topics uh, of their choosing for about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, I want to highlight the fact that both uh, that the events are very, very new. So uh, as we were discussing before uh, we came on live, this is we're still in the making sense process. So we we're basically going to be listening to both Professor Dastair and Rahimi tell us about their experience experience and how they are processing what's happening right now. Um, uh, after the uh, after both Professor Dastagir and Professor Rahimi uh, talk, we will open it up to questions. Having said that, uh, do not wait to, uh, to send your questions in. We have people that are taking questions in and they will be sending them to me and I will be collating them uh, throughout this process. And I will try to gather as many questions as I can into one hopefully cohesive question that I can then present to our speakers so they can answer. Uh, as I said, because the numbers are so high, I will not be naming uh, the per person who asked the questions. Instead, I'm going to be gathering a few questions together. Hopefully, your question will be answered in, in the way I'm going to pose it. So without further ado, I would like to uh, um, start with, prof I believe, Professor Rahimi, you're going first. Uh, I will ask Professor Rahimi to uh, to start. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, thank you for the Cornell University and South Asian Institute for uh, South Asian program for giving me the chance to speak. Uh, and thank you everyone for showing up. I, thank you very much. Um, so I, I decided that for this particular uh, panel, I will try to answer three questions the best I can. And I think these are the, to my mind, the three most important questions for me uh, um, to use to make sense of what happened, uh, um, what kind of conclude, what, what unfolded in Afghanistan um, in light of 
the past 20 months. So it has been unfolding for a very long time, but now I think from the vintage point of now, which includes the past uh, few weeks, uh, looking back, I think these are the three important questions. Uh, the first question I try to answer is, was Afghanistan a democracy before Taliban took over uh, Kabul? And um, that is a question that um, may not have been as urgent or pressing question um, had not uh, Taliban had not taken over Kabul. Uh, now, uh, I think the pace at which uh, uh, the government collapsed, uh, state institutions, uh, uh, lack of robustness has, for me, re uh, caused me to rethink this. Was Afghanistan a democracy over the past 20 years or not? Because often Taliban tried to um, contrast the regime with a democratic regime and uh, use the failure of the republic as an argument against uh, democratic governments and in favor of their ideological uh, uh, kind of regime that they 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 uh, they advocate for. Um, so was Afghanistan a democracy before Taliban? Um, there is a history here. Um, the Afghanistan, many may not know this, but uh, I'm sure uh, Professor Mustafa knows this, was one of the first countries to actually, uh, one of the first countries to Muslim countries to regain its full independence and became a, a part of the nation state world uh, in the 1920s, a long time ago. And even that, in that beginning moments of the, the, the independence, there were talks of constitutionalism. There were people and a small number of people um, who were thinking about um, how to build a nation state and on, they were discussing issues of constitution making and uh, and uh, constitutionalism as a way of um, legitimizing power, as a way of structuring power. So the whole idea of um, constitutionalism at least is 100 year old. Um, over time, some experiments happened, some constitutions were adopted in Afghanistan, elements of elections were introduced over time. And all those efforts culminated in 1964 in a constitutional monarchy. Afghanistan had an elected parliament and a constitutional monarchy in 1964. Um, it was a relatively uh, uh, functioning democracy. Um, uh, for example, there were prime ministers uh, who had to resign because of the student demonstrations in Kabul universities. Um, the, we, it was not stable politically, um, but it also was a testament to how uh, different constituencies could pressure uh, the government uh, and, and, and make demands on the government. We are talking about 1964. Um, but then through a series of events, a number of coups that had left leaning uh, and also nationalist leaning, that period of uh, experimenting with democracy kind of ended abruptly. And Afghanistan went through a kind of a downright spiral of coups, violence, foreign invasion. Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. Um, in response to the Soviet Union invasion, there was a, a, a local resistance uh, emerged. Uh, that resistance uh, was using nationalistic, but also Islamist ideas as a way to uh, resist against the Soviet invasion. That allowed for a certain ideas uh, uh, that were gaining currency at the time, idea of Islamist politics and, and, and the use of state power to transform societies in, in the vision of an Islamic society to gain uh, uh, prominence uh, in, in Afghanistan. Um, those developments culminated in uh, after the Soviet Union in, in invasion ended into a Taliban regime, which came out of the civil war that uh, broke down after Taliban uh, uh, after sorry, after uh, Soviet Union uh, withdrew from Afghanistan, a civil war broke out, and in that space, Taliban emerged. The civil war was basically between different Islamist uh, 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 political parties. The Taliban were um, merged as a more traditionalist uh, 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 Islamic movement um, from the from from the south of the country, an area that was um, neglected greatly uh, even during the, those uh, dominance of those political parties. And um, Taliban obviously. You know, it was a repressive regime, a theocracy uh, of some sort. And then uh, the 9-11 happened uh, and the United States decided to invade Afghanistan because Taliban had given sanctuary to the Osama bin Laden, the, the brain behind, uh, behind the, the, the Taliban movement, uh, behind the 9-11. And when the US toppled the Taliban through military force, the question was, what now? What kind of regime should uh, replace the Taliban in Afghanistan? And interestingly enough, they went back to the 1964 format. They went back to a period of Afghanistan history 
were uh, estate and institutions had a lot of legitimacy and the constitution was seemed to have a lot of, uh, the political regime seemed to have a lot of uh, 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 broad-based legitimacy in Afghanistan. They went back in 1964. So the 2004 constitution, the, the political system that emerged after the US invasion, tried to model itself after the, uh, the 1964 Afghan constitutional uh, monarchy. Uh, there was a debate as to whether the monarchy should be kept or not. Uh, briefly, it was discussed, but generally it, uh, the people involved uh, favored a presidential system over a monarchy. So basically the position of the monarch was replaced with a president, but a lot of other elements of the 1964 uh, uh, regime was preserved in the 2004 constitution. I say that to say that Afghanistan experiment with democracy, the idea of representative government and constitutionalism did not start in 2001 or two uh, after the fall of Taliban. Um, it had a very kind of, a, it had a pedigree in Afghanistan. And the moment of 2001 for a lot of people, especially those who had to leave Afghanistan as refugees, as diaspora was seen as a return to that past. Um, everything else was seen as a disruption, uh, uh, often foreign imposed because of the Soviet invasion and then other elements of an invasion. So a lot of Afghans saw the 2004 more of a continuation of an interrupted history rather than just an, an era, uh, a new uh, kind of uh, a place for new political ideas. Uh, I think that's an important historical context to keep in mind. Uh, so what was the, what happened in the post 2001 uh, uh, political order in Afghanistan? Was it a democracy? Certainly there were elections, um, uh, especially early on elections were very much welcomed and Afghanistan had like the largest, uh, one of the highest percentage of participation in the election. I think 60, 70% of the, uh, those who eligible registered and a large percentage of them actually voted. So it was a welcome development. The idea that people were given the chance to elect their leaders was a welcome development. And if you read any of the accounts from the time, um, it was very much welcomed. Um, the whole idea that the, now the people will have to have a say in matters of governance was very much welcomed. Um, there was also other um, development that happened at the same time. Media opened up. Um, there were newcomers coming in, uh, having political shows, also having cultural shows. It was very much welcome. Uh, the, the TV shows became a cultural phenomenon. Uh, and TV, uh, TV channels become cultural phenomenon in Afghanistan. The civil society also opened up. Um, there were a lot of people uh, who found their voice on different matters of women rights, democracy, um, also the issues of local identities of uh, their ethnicity, their communities, they were speaking up and, and in, in a relatively pluralistic way. I mean, there was uh, tension, but generally people were allowed to speak out, criticize. There were moments of backlash, but generally it, it was seen as a pluralistic uh, uh, political system. Uh, and it, it went through a lot of phases. I'm, obviously I'm summarizing 20 years, but I think the elements uh, we would look and say a system is democratic, were many were there. Uh, but they were on the other side, there were many failures as well. Um, elections were fraud, um, ma major um, fraud elections happened, um, especially uh, beyond the first uh, uh, election. Um, that meant that a lot of people became disillusioned uh, with the, um, their, 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 their right to influence, the, to elect their leaders and influence the, their government. Also, the political system was very centralized, meaning the people, ability to influence government was actually limited to an election that was happening five every five years. And even that election was often seen as very fraudulent. So the government was not very accountable to the population. Um, the president, uh, as I said, was made in the picture of a monarch, uh, even constitutionally, and enjoyed a lot of power. And uh, all the systems of checks and balance and other ways that you would think uh, would hold the presidency accountable or those in power accountable tended to fail. And people um, were often, the, the, the return to people often happened around the election times and those election times were very uh, uh, fraud with, with fraud, fraud and, and a lot of irregularities. So that's kind of one of the uh, pieces you can look at to think of, okay, Afonso was a democracy or not. It was a very flawed one. There was also um, restrictions on uh, many types of communities ability to participate. Um, uh, there, President and uh, the political rulers in Afghanistan, two consecutive uh, uh, administration, were often seen by many Afghans as trying to disenfranchise um, certain communities in Afghanistan. So there were many communities in Afghanistan who saw the state policies as attempting to disenfranchise them. 
often the state advocated for those policies in the name of anti-corruption and called uh, those who were targeted as warlords or, or corrupt, which were often true, but the way it was perceived by the population was that, okay, the state is trying to disenfranchise me. Um, my communities, basically, uh, who saw the presentation in those figures, local communities saw the presentation in those, in those figures, um, partly because there was no, the administrations did not allow for political party to form. So people, uh, communities, form of self-expression often were um, kind of limited to certain individuals um, who often were accused of corruption and, 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 and violence and, 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 and so many different things. Uh, so in short, was a partisan democracy um, before Taliban. It was a very flawed democracy. It was a very flawed democracy. Elections were not great. The, the, the government used its power, its resources to disenfranchise different communities. It, it was perceived as such. And fundamentally, it was a corrupt system. All those in power, all those ruling power were not held accountable to the, uh, um, to the population. Population had a very, very, hard, very li little opportunity to voice. They could voice many times, but they had a very limited opportunity to actually influence a governance and hold those in power accountable. It had led to a culture of impunity and a government that was not really accountable to the population. Why that occurred, I think, lead me to the second issue. Uh, uh, what was the role of the US in making and unmaking the Afghan Republic, referring to the past 20 years? So US went in Afghanistan, first of all, uh, as, as many know, for a, with a very narrow kind of um, vision. They were, they were there to uh, dismantle Al-Qaeda and the sanctuaries. There was no vision of rebuilding the state. Uh, there was some debates going on in, in the Afghan, in the uh, uh, US administration at the time as to whether they should uh, attempt nation building or attempt state building as a counterinsurgency approach, basically trying to make sure that there is a system in place that would prevent the Taliban re-emerging and, and, and the threat of, democracy, uh, threat of terrorism emerging. Um, and those are actually later debates. Early on, the idea was that we go in and we are so have certain individuals who would like to kill and there are certain networks who would like to disrupt. And it was just basically an counter terrorism operation led many, mostly by the CIA, um, because US military was not actually that large, the president was not that large early on. It was led, led by CIA and CIA allies on the ground, which were basically warlords, the people who were abusing and, and, and preying on the population uh, for a very long time. The US uh, CIA allied with them as to actually conduct counter uh, terrorism. What they are actually about to do again with the Taliban, thinking, okay, we're gonna have to go after certain individuals, certain networks, and uh, we're going to have to work with actors on the ground, no matter who they are, and without a lot of thought given as to what would happen to the Afghan population if we do choose to engage with these certain actors for these certain objectives. Uh, so U.S. was pretty much trying to do um, counter-terrorism for a very long time, and as a result, they um, aligned and empowered, allied themselves with and empowered the worst actors in the Afghan politics. You could The worst actors you could think of and that meant for the population, they saw the US um, presence in many parts of the country um, as empowering the worst people in the eyes of the population, allowing them to uh, loot whatever aid was coming in because a lot of contracts were given to those people who were aligned with the US presence and also closing eyes on how they tre was treating the population, what they were, they were doing to the people. They saw the US as a kind of a bystander or enabler of the, what was happening. Uh, so also that, that was one image of the US, partly because there was US was doing mostly uh, counterterrorism. When the US decided to do more counterinsurgency and the idea of nation building came up and they were trying to do more, it was often um, done uh, in a very haphazard way, not with a lot of oversight and was done through the same set of actors and, that, and many Afghans were seen as corrupt and, and, and predatory towards them. And, to be honest, a lot of money was left with was spent with very little oversight in a very short period of time because U.S. was in a habit of having artificial deadlines, but how what the result they wanted to achieve at certain uh, intervals. Like for example, Obama made a surge and then put a deadline on the surge, basically saying that okay, this is how the future is going to play out, and this is how our scenario of war is going to be, our scenario of Afghan politics going to be. Um, beforehand without actually considering the facts on the ground and such. Uh, so that's the contribution of the US in the, creating the political system. It created basically a rentier system in my, in my view. Um, 
Afghan politicians were much more accountable to the Americans than they were to the Afghan population um, because most of the money was coming out from outside and they were being empowered by, by, the, by the US military. The US military um, objective were very much in terms of for a very long time counterterrorism, not in terms of uh, how Afghanistan is being governed. And at times when governance became an issue, often there was a trade-off being made with the uh, between CIA and military wanting to do war on terror, and then, for example, USID or the Department of State wanting to do nation building, state building, and then um, they often were seen in contradiction to each other at times because of this involvement of certain actors or 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 or, or, or certain developments, and the U.S. government often worked against each other. I mean, those two objectives of counterterrorism and nation building often counsel each other out and in the process caused a lot of Afghan lives. So you have to look at like Afghan population, how they are looking at this. They seen um, all this unfolding and not many people caring about what's um, happening to the Afghans, the wars being empowered, corruption going on, uh, basically unchecked. And a lot of this happening in my eyes of Afghans uh, because the US uh, is a bystander or is just an enabler. Uh, of all of this. Okay, that's kind of in terms of how the US might have contributed to the uh, making and unmaking of the past 20 year system. Um, also the presence of the US um, created political space, uh, a space for um, Afghans to actually speak out on matters, uh, on matters that they cared about too, women rights, uh, obviously women education, um, different communities in Afghanistan, minorities were, were empowered through the US presence just because of the space that was created. Those should not also be denied. There were development gains as well. Um, if you just look at life expectancy, expectancy of Afghans improved greatly uh, during the, the US presence in Afghanistan. Number of women in the school obviously go, went from zero to, to millions, like 40% of I think uh, students in Afghan schools uh, until Taliban took over were, were women. Uh, higher education as well, women in the position of leaderships, the numbers obviously, uh, uh, rose um, greatly. So that's kind of a mixed picture of the US presence in Afghanistan, the good and the bad. And lastly, I'll just talk very briefly, I don't know how much time I have, but I will talk very briefly about the uh, relation of the Taliban with the population. Right? Are they popular or not? The data we have, the data we have from Afghanistan or the representative survey tell us that Taliban are not popular. Um, maybe eight to 10% of the population uh, express sympathy for their ideology um, of the Taliban, like if you look at the uh, Asia Foundation survey from 2019, 10%, uh, 9, 10% of the population expressed sympathy for their ideology. Um, but it doesn't mean that many Afghans did not choose at different time to join Taliban or support them. And I, the way I make sense of that is through state failure. There was a failed um, state or a predatory state for most of the country um, and for, for, for a lot part of the countries. And Afghans were making practical choice to align themselves with the side that would provide them with protection or uh, also would allow them to pursue their own um, their objectives. It could have been autonomy uh, from the central government, those objectives. It could have been just the local dynamic feuds of rivalries between, between different groups. It could have been just uh, corruption and, and smuggling. Uh, sorry, it could have been opium and smuggling objectives that could have been better served if a group allied itself with, with the Taliban versus the government. Um, so if I had to stay briefly, Taliban were very good at play, manipulating local power dynamic, uh, partly because they, uh, they had better knowledge uh, underground. They were much more um, closer to the local dynamics than this overly centralized Afghan government. Also, they did not have to govern. They were an insurgency, so there are uh, their objective was to cause the state to collapse. They were not there to build anything. And uh, obviously that's a completely different task than a government that is trying to govern. Um, it means that they did not have to win, just the Afghan government had to fail at governing. And Afghanistan was already handicapped. The government was handicapped because of corruption, basically kleptocracy, uh, and also the, uh, the, the double the structure of the US objective in Afghanistan um, that was often getting in the way of a state building in the country as well. Uh, so they were trying to cause the state to collapse. They were not against a very strong state and they succeeded at that mostly often, most of the time by using brute force, being brutal and vicious, but also sometimes by manipulating a uh, local dynamic. So I think the U Taliban 
were not popular, but they did not have to be to achieve their objectives. And now that they have achieved their objective, whether they will be able to govern Afghanistan, um, that's a question we're going to have to just remain to see. Uh, I will stop here and uh, we're happy to answer questions later on. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much that you gave us a lot to think about. Uh, I think I'm going to switch directly to uh, Professor Dastagir, um, 10 to 15 minutes, because we want to make sure that we have, uh, there's a lot of questions waiting, so we want to make sure we have uh, time to answer as many questions as possible. But we're looking forward to hearing from you, Professor. All right, so um, that was a very eloquent and very interesting um, listening to what Haroon was saying. I completely agree with it, with what he said. Um, he, he painted this very uh, sort of looked back in time and explained how we got here. Um, the thoughts that I'm going to share with you today are more rooted strictly in the present. I will look back at times, um, but only insofar as the past, um, the more immediate past, the nearer past helps us understand the present. Um, first, just um, a couple of moments about the past couple of weeks. Um, the, and, and thank you to the South Asia program. Thank you for, thank you um, to Cornell University for inviting me. Um, this is the first time I'm talking uh, to, first time I'm talking, not writing. And uh, it's, it's not easy putting into words um, my thoughts just because uh, I think, um, you know, I'm still just trying to make sense of it. it, it the Blitzkrieg campaign of Taliban at the beginning of August was, you know, very sudden. There had been a tense, relatively gradual um, campaign of military takeover in the in the uh, weeks uh, and months preceding that. But this accelerated with dizzying speed um, towards the end of the first week of August, the beginning of the second week of August, I think. Um, and and seeing it unfold um trying to understand and process what we were seeing you know making sense of it while at the same time functioning answering emails and you know um that that has been a challenge um for me and i i think others as well you know you you know you are in the pulse of history um you know that as uh you know as a lecturer um you should be trying to speak to the inner life of the politics of the moment, but really what you end up doing is just spending most of your energy trying to uh, not fall apart, you know, um, to, to be who you were before all this, uh, before these cataclysmic convulsive move, movement um, changes took place, um, trying to finish tasks in the same pace as before. Um, but, at any given mo at any given point, um, you know, and I, I think I speak for many right now, not just for myself. At any given point, there is this deep tiredness of the mind, and I think it comes from just trying to come 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 to grips with what's happening, trying to process it, trying to understand it, um, and uh, so it's a lot of things. But I but I think one of one of the key causes is also just either for the first time or again to be in the state of exile um to be uh, to be outside of your home to be in exile is a very disorienting uh experience and i think if if i am not just speaking for myself um but if i'm also speaking to the experience of other afghans who have um you know who have found themselves almost unable to articulate um what has taken place over the past couple of weeks um then you know it may be it may just be that uh, experience of exile um which is bewildering um that notwithstanding i the second thing i want to speak to a little bit is um why i am hopeful um why I think there is a case to be made for uh, optimism. Um, I think to engage fully with the present moment, to carve out space for ourselves to act, um, both 
those who are in the diaspora and those who are in Afghanistan, you know, to, to be able to influence, uh, to shape what is to come, that requires from us that we are both able to fully appreciate in the sense of understand, grasp um, the risks of this moment, the nightmarish potential that it holds that we are reminded of every day, social media, talking to people um, in Afghanistan and so on, but also to understand that in the uncertainty of the moment, there is a potential for positive change as well, okay? And that's hope. There is a space for hope in that uncertainty as well. So I think many are sort of uh, holding their breath and waiting to see what's going to happen. Um, and it's worth saying here that, you know, we have lost something, yes, and, and I'm, as Haroon also touched upon, I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about why, you know, we have to be very careful not to uh, gloss over the, um, the weaknesses and the shortcomings of what was lost. Um, but so yes, that something, something is, we have lost something, but we've also gained an opportunity for something else. Um, in many, you know, in so many instances across the world, and in just across the border in Pakistan, grassroots constituencies um, have had victories. They're having victories uh, despite of odds that seem insurmountable. Um, in Pakistan, I'm thinking specifically of, of PTM, Pashtun Tahafus moment, movement, sorry. Um, so, so that teaches us that popular power has the potential to be a profound force for change. Um, the, the people of the, sorry, the power of the people, in other words. Um, but I think in order for that to be unlocked in Afghanistan, it's important that Afghans understand that our agency matters. You know, what we do matters. Um, the past four decades um, have been very disempowering. And I think many Afghans have forgotten um, or, or sort of become blind to the power they actually have uh, as a collective, as a community. There's been a great degree of fragmentation as well, um, contributing to that uh, sense of disempowerment, um, to that amnesia, that collective amnesia of the power we actually have, the, the constant foreign interventions. Um, but today, we have several um, generations that are politically conscious. Um, that kind of political awareness and political self-confidence isn't just going to dissipate because of a change of power in Kabul, okay? That it isn't gonna go anywhere. That remains. I was born in Afghanistan, but I grew up abroad. We were refugees. And I remember as a child, you know, having this sense of despair in my home, you know, the, the sense of the loss of the homeland, the experience of, exile uh, that permeated my childhood. Um, but I don't think, and I really don't want to think that this is going to be the case with those who um, have been displaced today, nor with those who are in Afghanistan. Um, the world today is different. We are more connected. Um, there are more levers of influence. Um, we are, again, want to come back to this point, we are less fragmented as an Afghan community than we were then, fo immediately following the internecine civil war of the 90s. Um, the, um, I, I might touch upon later that the logic of the civil war, um, you know, that, that saw different communities, you know, look at each other with distrust that log and, and compete with one another. Um, that logic carried on over into the post-bomb political order. So we did, there were remnants, there were remnants of the civil war, even during, the, you know, during the Kazai and the Rani administrations. Um, but I saw something really encouraging um, a couple of weeks ago. And, and I think it's just the crescendo of, of things that also preceded tendencies and movements and patterns that preceded in the, in, in the 
past year, I think, I, uh, past 18 months or so, I would say, um, there was a there were a couple of days and this was uh before herat fell um where this uh this movement came to be it was very nascent and it's you know it's disappeared um there there may be pockets of it left but afghans coming together and you know standing on their roofs um and uh and chanting allahu akbar um so so that was something really moving, um, really powerful for me. Um, just an example, I, I, see it, I see it elsewhere as well. Um, but it, anyway, it, it, it is the reason that I am optimistic. And, you know, I have to be optimistic. People like Karun, people like myself, um, others who have had opportunities, who, who who are privileged enough to have their voice, voices heard, um, they have to be optimistic. I think, um, you know, I think withdrawing into a position of disengagement is dangerous. Um, and it would be a great, you know, it would be a great injustice to, uh, to Afghanistan, to the people of Afghanistan, if we were to do that. Um, finally, I just want to say that what we weren't able to get right during the Doha process, during the peace process, we can get that right now. Um, you know, people tend to speak, I've heard some tend to speak of the peace process as finished, and that makes sense, you know. The difference is now we're talking to a government, you know, they hold supreme power on Afghan soil, we speak to them not as a negotiating uh, negotiating partner or a counterpart, um, but as the people. Um, and we do this from inside Afghanistan with, with limitations, and we do it from the diaspora, from outside with fewer uh, limitations. So um, I don't, there was a big battle in Panjshir last night, brave men fought and, um, but I don't think that, you know, I don't think the fight for Afghanistan's soul, the fight for Afghanistan's future is going to be determined in this or that battle. I think this is something that's going to play out for many years to come. Um, hope, you know, I think it's going to play out quietly. It's going to play out in, in, in a, you know, in a, in a multitude of decisions that are made. Um, both at the government level, at the individual level, at community level, it really has to do with, you know, what risks are we going to take? What risks do we feel courageous enough to take? Who do we want to become? And how are we going to relate to one another? How, and most crucially, how are we going to approach those with whom we disagree? I'm going to stop there. Um, uh, yeah, I'll stop there. I hope that made sense. Thank you very much. It made a lot of sense, and it's actually a great place to to jump from um, hope um, and uh, knowing that there are still things to be done and there are people that are eager to do them. So a lot of the times the discussion around Afghanistan, particularly in the last two weeks, has been basically centered around um, the end something is ending and we don't know what's going to happen so being reminded that there's always something that can be done is is incredibly important uh, to hear for us outsiders and for afghanis that are listening i uh, um so i want to thank you both very much for uh, uh first for um uh, haroon's intervention in which he actually gave us a very good succinct uh kind of uh, summary of what's going on uh in the last 20 years in the in the administration that ha that was there before the taliban and possibilities of what might happen uh, more recently and also of course professor Dastavir and um her reflection on her experience now and what she sees as the possibilities in the future there are a lot of questions waiting uh i what i've been doing uh, while i was listening to you is trying to actually figure out which questions would fit together so i'll try to fit as many of them as possible but i'm going to give myself the privilege <laughs> of asking the first question about something that is very close to my heart and i think close to the heart of many people that are listening and that is the future of 
the youth, particularly vis-a-vis -vis education. So uh, here I'm thinking of both the professors uh, um, uh, and the teachers, but also the students, both um, in the school system and the multitude of universities uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, I, basically, I want to ask the question of what do you envision the immediate future to look like? Some, some answers you already have, because both of you are still involved in the education system there, albeit from outside of Afghanistan. And some of it will require some um, uh, demands that you can put on us, people, in, uh, the people that are involved in education in the West, uh, uh, and what we can do to help. For example, uh, Cornell is involved. Uh, in, in hosting two uh, uh, scholars at risk from Afghanistan that are, uh, we're, uh, that are coming here. Other universities are doing it as well. But, uh, uh, and this is one way we can contribute, but there's other ways I'm sure that we can, uh, that, that I would like you to talk to about possibilities of making sure that this huge young population, most of the young population, most of the population of Afghanistan, like 70% of the population is 25 or under. A lot of them are, eng are engaged in schools or universities. So this sudden interruption, a lot of the times ends up, uh, ends up affecting the youth more than anybody else and thus the future more than anything else. What can be done? What do you envision for us to start doing now, both for Afghanis inside of Afghanistan and Afghanis that had to leave Afghanistan? Um, what can we do? What can we do as academic institutions to try and make sure that all of this brain power, all of this potential is not wasted because of what just happened? And I will, I will open that, I will leave that question with uh, uh, Professor Dastagir and then uh, 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 maybe we can hear from Rahimi afterwards, Professor Rahimi afterwards. Okay, thank you so much for that. It's such an important question and it's one that's very close to heart for many of us um, who are working with Afghan youth. Um, I, I'm sure uh, Professor Rahimi will agree, you know, the students that the youth that I know personally, they are brilliant. They're absolutely brilliant. And they are, you know, they can go to, I, I see them going to the best universities in the world and thriving, you know, they just have more obstacles in their way. Um, there are more obstacles. And so I think that justifies um, extending a hand to them. I think that justifies helping them. So I am so happy that there is this, you know, emerging, um, willingness in in places like the US to help them um, and to perhaps make that very rocky uphill difficult path a little bit easier um, you know being applying for a applying for a master's degree or uh, it, it presents I mean it's difficult enough on its own right but when you have the sort of challenges that our students do and other, uh, you know, bright, bright uh, young Afghans do in Afghanistan right now, it becomes almost insurmountable. So just the mere fact that you are thinking along these lines, that you're asking these questions, that you're reaching out to us and, and want to hear what specifically can be done. I, I am so heartened by that. Um, I think this has to be an ongoing conversation, um, you know, because needs needs change and what you what you see you know what you see as most uh urgent um right now could might more slightly morph into something else a few months from now so um so uh yes definitely uh it's very much appreciated and um i i hope this become this becomes an ongoing conversation where we can continue to help inform your thinking on how exactly you you can help um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jesse. Professor Rahimi. Um, I think that is a big component. Uh, that is an important component of uh, how um, the world can engage with the Afghan youth, um, giving them the opportunity to continue their education abroad, um, um, and making it easier now that they're going to be even facing more challenges. But looking at the people, the Afghans who are going to have to uh, just going to uh, stay back, stay behind in Afghanistan. Um, the challenge is enormous. Uh, as you said, Afghanistan is an incredibly young population. Uh, we can look at higher education and uh, 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 like um, up to high school. Uh, the, the both, I mean, half of the population is below 14. Uh, 
um, like 50, uh, 40 something percent of the population is below 14. So they are actually going to school. Millions of kids are going to school. Making sure that this, that, that is sustained, that, that, um, that um, is sustained and grows. That's a hugely important task. Uh, there's going to be different components to it. Some of it just going to be money. Uh, the uh, Afghanistan state um, was funded by a true aid um, to a large extent, three, four, quarter, three fourth quarter of it. And a part of that money was going to education. Um, if um, that money stops for whatever reason, uh, then it means just simply millions of kids won't have the chance to get an education. So that's the kind of the humanitarian side of it, making sure the education sector does not suffer is a big factor. The other factor is just looking at the woman girls education. Taliban have already talked about imposing restrictions and um, it's been so far mostly about separation, which I think is problematic, but I would uh, argue that we may um, have to engage, um, engage to uh, make education possible, even in a, a segregated manner, just because I think that that is, that's infinitely preferred to not having uh, 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 girls educated in Afghanistan, but I'm also worried uh, in terms of the future about the uh, the possible curriculum, like what kids going to be taught, because Taliban are an ideological movement. It is an ideological uh, going to be an ideological state, and ideological states are known not to be um, not to allow freedom of thoughts and be very keen about controlling uh, institutions of socialization, like the places where people, uh, 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 especially young people, are. Their, their views are formed. And I'm very much worried about that happening, that we would have, right now they put people in charge of the both education, uh, higher education and the Minister of Education, who are basically, their, their, uh, their, uh, they represent their ideology. So far the debates have been about opening the schools, but I imagine the future debate is gonna be about what's gonna be taught in the schools. And I think in terms of what we can do is just continued engagement, highlighting those issues and pushing back. Taliban seem to be somewhat sensitive um, to the world's judgment. And I think that is one of the levers that is left. Um, so providing funding for education to continue at the same time engaging to put the pressure on the Taliban to allow kids and women to continue to educate, uh, get education and also being mindful about uh, working for freedom of thought and, and, and freedom of education in Afghanistan. Um, maybe at this point, I should highlight that both of you are outside of Afghanistan, but both of you are still teaching uh, remotely. Uh, uh, so the, the, there's still a lot of effort to maintain the, uh, the university, particularly the American University of Afghanistan, even though you feel compelled to be outside of the country at this moment in time. Uh, so again, there is hope. Um, uh, I have a lot of questions that I'm going to try and uh, summarize. A lot of the questions that are coming up um, are asking about the influence, both historical and possibly in the future, of foreign states on how uh, Afghanistan was influenced first uh, 20 before 20 years during the 20 year period and possibly now we're talking specifically uh, about three states that keep coming up in the questions not surprisingly uh, Saudi Arabia uh, Pakistan and Iran uh, so the questions are asking uh, what do you see the role of these three states that have in one way or another been in, uh, involved in, in the internal politics of Afghanistan uh, in the past, influencing what, was, what is about to happen now that the Taliban are in control? Of course, we know that Taliban is deeply engaged with, with you know, they're friends with Qatar, and Qatar is part of like a kind of the liaison in that, in that pit. So there's the Gulf particularly, but also Iran and, and Pakistan because of their proximity and for other reasons would be deeply involved. So how can you can you kind of comment on how they were involved before and how do you see their role changing uh, uh, now? Um, I'll leave that uh, question up to whoever would like to answer it. Um, Rahim, if you want to go. Sure, I will give some brief comments and then uh leave it to uh, to Muska to uh, to elaborate and, and share her thoughts um in terms of the uh, first question i think that is an important observation um and in that um, afghan states nation states starting from the 19th century were always dependent on foreign support um most often as they embarked upon different uh, process of consolidating consolidating power against their own population um the external threats were actually later um, in, 
early on, it was a matter of consolidating power and extending the power of the central authority to the entire country. Um, and that also is an important piece to all of this because it tells you that Afghanistan historically have not had a government that was very much accountable to the population. Because if you're a state that is dependent on foreign support, um, um, so your military gets funding from outside and, 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 and such, you really don't need the consent of the government that much. And Afghan, Afghan governments historically have not depended on the support of, uh, Afghan governments have not depended on the support of the population. Um, and that's a, a, and it's a historical kind of a fact and it's, it's continuous. It is a continuous, it's continuously present to us Afghan history. I mean, there is uh, ebbs and flow, but generally that is the case. Um, I think that's an important context to keep in mind that that was true even through the past 20 years. Uh, the political system was very much uh, external looking um, and, 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 and for independent. The political class were a rentier class who were extracting resources, most often aid, because that was the most important resource. resource. And the people really had very little control over who was getting aid, how the aid was distributed, and had very little power over the elite just because they were not dependent on the population on the consent of the government. With regard to the country, specific countries you talked about, I think we can look at different phases in history. Um, but right now, if you look at the current vintage point, Taliban have been very good at uh, um, maintaining relationship with many parties. So the old image of Taliban being uh, directly dependent on the Saudi Arabia, which was a uh, uh, it was more through to it in the 1990s where they were a prior state and they were receiving a lot of funding through different networks that was had uh, their origins from Saudi Arabia and to the um, handling of the Pakistan and government. I think that's um, that they Taliban have learned a lesson from that. Uh, and that lesson is that they would like to have relationship with other countries and they would like to not become a prior state again. Now, the way I look at it, they have a very diverse Kind of um, um, relationships. They want to have a relationship with China. They've reached out to China. They still have relationship uh, with Saudi Arabia, but it's not as important, it seems. Just as you know, Qatar has a uh, not um, so great relationship with the Gulf countries and Saudi Arabia. And Qatar has been so prominent in the Afghan politics. It tells you that that old dependency of the 90s with regard to Saudi Arabia is probably not there anymore, uh, or at least it's not as prominent anymore. Iran and many regional countries have expressed willingness uh, uh, to work with the Taliban, um, and Taliban have welcomed them, although they have their own conditions and they have their own leverage against the group and they have their own narrow interests that they want the Taliban to, to, uh, to safeguard. So I would say many countries that have influence over Taliban, but the image of the Taliban as um, being entirely dependent on one country I think no longer holds, um, especially uh, now that they are in power. Um, I think they are pursuing a more diverse, uh, kind of a more inclusive foreign policy, um, uh, depending, I, th I think, drawing based on lessons of the 90s. Uh, and they did that up to now as well, towards their end, after the US legitimized them, gave them the Doha office, kind of started engaging with the Taliban. The Taliban were basically on a world tour, uh, talking to people, selling themselves as a partner in Afghanistan and trying to build relationships. And I think they've succeeded in building relationships in, with many countries. Thank you. Uh, is there something you would like to add, Professor Dastagi? Uh, yes, thank you. So I um, noted that um, Taliban proclaimed that the, a couple of days ago um, when the Americans uh, left um, the airport, Taliban proclaimed that this was, you know, this was Afghanistan finally gaining its uh, independence. But in, it is a fact that Taliban maintains strong ties with Pakistan. And that's, you know, as you were mentioning, those three countries, um, starting with Saudi Arabia, nestling Pakistan in the middle, uh, ending with Iran, I, I thought one is unlike any of the other. I think uh, Pakistan, sorry, Pakistan stands apart. Um, in the way it has aided and abetted uh, Taliban, and may, many Afghans do see them as doing the, do see Taliban as doing the bidding of Pak Pakistan, which on top of other things, you know, which on top of human rights violations and so on, um, corrodes the legitimacy of Taliban in the eyes of Afghans. Afghans are very, um, yeah. So, um, what is a question mark today? Um, is how heavily dependent um, will will Taliban be on Pakistan? How dense are these ties 
going to be going forward. Um, there is a well-documented uh, body of literature that um, on how Pakistan has provided sanctuaries, financial help, logistics, and so on. Um, now, the, the question today is, and I, I don't know the answer to it, will the experience of holding stewardship over the state, um, uh, will that change the calculations of the Taliban uh, that made it, um, that, you know, that once made it expedient for it to partner closely with Pakistan, will, will that change now? that they are, where, where they are, you know, forming a government. I, I don't know, but I hope so. I hope so, you know. Um, they have, on their part, there is often the charge flung at, um, flung at, you know, anti-Taliban Afghans that, you know, you were the slaves of the Americans, you were, you were, again, you know, you were working for the foreigners, but that exact same sentiment exists with a very large segment of the Afghan population when they consider Taliban, you know? Um, I speak with people in, I speak with my, my family members in Kabul, my, my friends in Kabul, I talk to them, I ask them, so do you interact with, do you interact, have you interacted with uh, the young fighters who, are, who, stand in the, who stand in the streets? And one of the things that I've been nervous about hearing is um, people telling me, oh, they don't speak Pashto or Farsi, you know, they, they don't speak languages. This is something I've been nervous about hearing, but to my relief, what I've heard is that they speak the purest Pashto, they speak the purest Farsi. So that has been a really positive thing, um, but my concerns going into these conversations are, uh, you know, illustrative. They, they, they sort of, um, I hope they illustrate the kind of concerns that many Afghans have of who, who are actually in charge right now? Is it is it the Taliban, or are there players behind the Taliban dictating um, dictating something to them? Um, I think going forward, um, it's in the interest of Taliban to um, not sever ties. Of course not. You know, Afghanistan has to be connected with its neighborhood. It has to be integrated uh, into the region and have uh, have good relations with its neighbors, but the sort of relationship where another state dictates to our government, you know, what, what policies to implement, what sort of educational policies to have, what, which countries, what sort of bilateral relations we can have with other countries, that isn't going to work in the long term, you know. Um, there are a lot of, there are a lot of flaws and weaknesses of this moment. There is a lot that worries us, but one thing that it also is, is a reset. It's a reset, okay? You have power now. Taliban has power now. You have the chance to right some wrongs, you know? Not just the wrongs that you yourself committed back when you were in power uh, from 1996 to 2001, but also the wrongs of the previous um, regime, they call it, you know, the, the administrations of Kazai and Rani, you have, or the Republic, you know, you have a chance to right some, some wrongs here, get it right from the beginning, you know, um, so it is my hope that, uh, it's my hope that they, um, that they mean it when they say they want Afghanistan to be independent. Thank you very much. Uh, we are aiming to end in about uh, 15 minutes, so I'm going to try and uh, ask the questions as quickly as I can. Before I do that, though, I want to point out that we have put in, in the chat the link to the uh, Scholars Rescue Fund, uh, the IIE Scholars Rescue Fund. They are the organization which uh, Cornell is working with uh, to host a couple of uh, um, professors here at least temporarily from Afghanistan but we've also worked with them in the past to host professors from Turkey and other places uh, people that find themselves uh, in a position of being threatened because of their scholarship um, uh, I, there's also a lot of comments and questions saying how can we help particularly Afghani women and girls that in education uh, um, or what can we do uh, how, what can Americans do as opposed to the American government there's a cover there's a question about the American government in a second uh, I think that's a conversation that will continue. Hopefully, we'll be able to work with you, uh, both of you and others, to try and actually 
forward that discussion about what can we do as people here in academia in the West to try and, and work to make sure that women and girls continue to be in, in education, whether that happens in, 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 in Afghanistan or not. Uh, there is a question, though, about the American government, and I want to make the distinction between us and the American government, because the American government, of course, has its own uh, values and, and its own goals. I'm going to read the question from a Cornell student exactly as uh, uh, she wrote it. So uh, it's 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 so I'm just going to say that it's quote, uh, given the role of the US in historically undermining nation building in Afghanistan, what do you envision the role of the US uh, being moving forward? How can the United States mitigate the damage it has done and make reparations? That's a very important word and make reparations for the atrocities it has committed while supporting the agency of the Afghan people in rebuilding Afghanistan? Very big question, kind of strongly worded, but I, I, I but it's important that it gets asked. Uh, so um, who would like to um, tackle this one? Raise your hand. I don't want to push uh, 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 either one it. to go. How do we go for it? Um, so that so just it's important to remember that the U.S. engagement with Afghanistan did not start with 9/11. Uh, there is a civil war context here. Uh, the United uh, U.S. first seriously became interested in Afghanistan when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, and saw in. Uh, uh, arming, uh, supporting the often most extremist um, um, Islamist uh, parties underground in fighting against uh, against the uh, against the Soviet invasion, because um, most often partly because their hands of the U.S. was guided by the Pakistani establishment, and they had their favorite in terms of who was fighting the the Soviet Union at the time, and the U.S. basically was providing the resource and the funds, but the actual uh, delivery and, and selecting of who to support was left up to the Pakistan uh, who uh, were uh, seen as having better intel, better relationship, better knowledge of how, how to actually um, support the, the process, uh, the, the fighters on the ground. So the U.S. Um, guided by the Pakistan uh, tunneled a lot of money to the most extremist uh, parties, extremist meaning even by Afghan standards, I'm not talking about like non-liberal, the people who did not have a lot of constituency in Afghanistan just because of their understanding of Islam, which differed greatly with the kind of conservative, but yet uh, much more um, uh, uh, pluralistic and much more accepting of differences of understanding of Islam that was practiced in Afghanistan before the war. So that um, happened uh, until the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan ended, the Soviet Union drew its troops, and then the US interest dropped in Afghanistan. Uh, Pakistan. I still uh, tried to and, and maintain some influence. It was it was a part of what unfolded in terms of civil war that is called in Afghanistan. And then US came back in 2001 and they um, became, gained new interest because of the 9-11 event and tragic event of 9-11. And then they came to Afghanistan and engaged again, re-engaged again. This time um, they were mostly interested in counterterrorism for a very long time and later they thought about maybe we should do some nation building or what's called counter insurgency as a part of a counter insurgency. And it was pretty much a, a chaotic effort over the past 20 years. In terms of what US should be doing from now, uh, what is doing, what is doing and what it should be doing. I think the President Biden uh, is trying to uh, narrow the Afghan, the US interest in Afghanistan to only matters of uh, terrorism, like counter terrorism. I think that's absolutely wrong. Uh, I think uh, fighting terrorism is generally not a matter of killing people, killing individuals. That seems to be the way that uh, so Biden's thinking about it. Like these are certain bad actors, we're gonna drone them out or we're gonna somehow kill these people and the terrorism is gonna go away. I think you need to build um, effective governance um, and that often requires resources. So I think one way, uh, uh, one question putting forward will be how the efforts of the state building in Afghanistan is preventing a complete, uh, breakdown of, 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 of law and order, just complete failure of the state, how can that be avoided? And that will often requires resources. How those resources should be channeled, who they should be given to, how they should be conditioned. I think those are legitimate debates to have. I think the uh, um, US should choose to engage in a more comprehensive way, not just a matter of counterterrorism, even if the US sees its interest in Afghanistan in matter of counterterrorism only, I think, 
um, the a narrow understanding of what it means to actually uh, address uh, terrorist tra threats from Afghanistan is just, I think, problematic. And there's a lot of literature and, and history that support that, I think, in, at least in my reading of, reading of it. Um, it also, frankly, as you, I think, hinted at, there is a moral obligation. Uh, whatever transpired in Afghanistan was the result of actions of Afghans, Af especially Afghan elites, who were often empowered by the Americans. I mean, as I said, Afghan, the population did, was very much powerless because the elite did not need the consent of the government. Really, they did not. The money was coming from outside, uh, and it was not conditioned on popularity of the elites. Many Afghan uh, uh, political elites who received, who were at the top of the power for a very long period of time, and it's not just the president, just the whole class, were incredibly unpopular, but it did not affect their power and, and not that much because they did not depend on, 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 on the population for their uh, political support. So the U.S. was, uh, is, bears a moral responsibility for whatever was built in Afghanistan, good and bad. Good, I think there was, there's a lot to be proud of, women education, health sector, I mean, there's a lot of gain as well, just transformation of many, many Afghan lives. Uh, it's also happened, but all the bad things also, corruption, failure of the state, and people being left defenseless against uh, a small, well-organized, uh, uh, ideologically, uh, ideolo ideological and violent group now. I think US bears responsibility and they should seriously work with the other countries in the world uh, to find ways to actually uh, make the lives of Afghans better, engage with the Taliban as they are, uh, to make sure that Afghanistan does not become a failed state again, because it's going to be so, um, it's going to lead to humanitarian catastrophe, and I think it's going to make the world uh, less safe, including the United States. Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Dastari, do you have something to add to this? Yeah, I do. I am going to answer it in a slightly roundabout way um, by focusing on what what are what are some of the key challenges to Taliban right now and how the U.S. can sort of meet them there um, or, or, or tailor their conditions, tailor their um, engagement and bargaining with Taliban to accommodate those challenges. So one of the key challenges right now for Taliban is to maintain internal cohesiveness. Because they are going to govern, the question of whether they can maintain internal integrity, and I don't mean that as an ethical uh, construct or an ethical quantity, but in the sense of cohesiveness, that now has wider societal implications. Um, the factions, uh, Taliban, within Taliban, you have different factions. The factions have disparate views on how a Taliban government should govern. Um, and, um, and that has direct bearing on things like women's right to education, girls' right to schooling, women's right to work, inclusiveness along, um, along ethnic, religious, and linguistic um, dimensions. So, um, the, so whether the leadership, it's a key question right now, whether the leadership of the Taliban can streamline and enforce po policies um, all the way down through the organization, all the way down through the rank and file. Um, my impression is that, and, and this is also, uh, uh, others have written about this too, um, the younger caters, the younger generations of the movement, uh, there you have more hardliners. They are more influenced by a wider jihadist network um, that goes well beyond Afghanistan. The older ones experienced, you know, 1996 to 2001. They, they, I, I hope uh, they have a greater appreciation for what they did wrong um, uh, first time around. Um, and and I think that the U.S. Uh, engagement and the way that the U.S. bargains with Taliban should center on you know, should center on these very specific demands um, and they need to be put forward as conditions. So what are they? It is, you know, where, where the factions differ very much is um, uh, things like, um, you know, equal rights for girls and women, ensuring access to education, preventing, you know, preventing moves towards repression of ethnic minorities and so on. So really for the U.S. to be as, specific as possible. Um, yeah. 
Thank you very much. We literally have two minutes left, but uh, there is a question that was repeatedly answered. If you can answer it in as 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 succinctly as as possible, and it could be just a yes or a no, it should be fine. Literally two minutes, and it has to do be between the divide between Kabul and the rest of the country. Uh, so a lot of what we've been hearing about is really a kind of uh, a Kabul centric, uh, uh, but a lot of the questions are about do the people in the rest of the country, particularly outside of the urban centers. Uh, uh, share some of the views that we've been talking about? Is there a lot, mm, there seems to be the impression that there is a much bigger support for Taliban outside of Kabul or outside of the big centers. Is that true? And how do you bring them on board? How do you actually unify the urban and the non-urban uh, 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 population? This is in a nutshell. I tried to gather three questions together. Uh, do you have any thoughts on what I just said? I think, uh, uh, Haroon, you actually spoke very directly to this at one point, right? So I'm, I think I'm going to let you um, answer. I think um, since we have limited time, I just shortly, um, the gains of the past 20 years were not equally distributed. Um, there were parts of the countries that remain underdeveloped. Um, so gain were not evenly distributed. And the cost of the past 20 years, the cost of war on terror, the, co the cost of insurgency was not equally distributed. So uh, there, there, were, there are parts of the countries that suffered more the past 20 years and they gained very little. And so they think they feel differently about the collapse of Afghan government than the part of the country that gained more and suffered less, relatively speaking. Um, I think that's the way I try to make sense of it. In terms of the desires for like freedom of movement, for the girls to get an education, for them to have a, a livelihood, for them to be protected against state uh, interventions of the government telling them how to live their lives. I think there's a lot more in common in urban and rural areas. There was a report done by Afghanistan Analyst Network, empirical studies of uh, rural women. They asked them their desires and their hopes and the issues of like freedom of work, movement and such were shared by them as well. So I think it's not that they want different things but they've lived different lives over the past 20 years and that shapes their under, uh, kind of informs their understanding of what they feel about the government, the US presence or the Taliban. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. This was a great answer. Um, so we are out of time. This was a wonderful, really, really very informative discussion. We really appreciate your participation, uh, especially under the conditions that you're in. So this is very generous of you and we're really grateful. Um, I would like to thank both of you. I would like to thank my colleague Durba Ghosh. And I would like to thank uh, Daniel Bass and uh, Dadi, the, both from the um, uh, South Asia program for making this happen. Um, uh, Professor Ghosh, is there anything you would like to say before we close? No, I think I'm just very honored you were able to join us this afternoon and I'm so, so grateful. Um, I think as Muska said earlier, that you're still making sense of what happened. So I'm really, I think we're all very, very grateful that you joined us this afternoon. Thank you.